At the risk of sounding overly snobby and pretentious, I don't watch a lot of movies from the 70s. I don't really have any biases against them either. It's just I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, so movies to me have a certain vibe and a certain feel, a certain aesthetic to them. Now, since that aesthetic defined my childhood, and the technology of the times was a big part of that, the further back into the 70s we go, not only do I find, understandably so, the techniques a bit more primitive, often the dialogue and certainly the musical choices are so different from what I've come to expect from a film, I'm just turned off by the experience. Now, there are certain exceptions to this. One such film, Death Wish, which I saw in its entirety and loved just about every minute of, came out in 1974. When I go back to my childhood and watch all my movies that I love, of course I'm going to think they're better than things that are out today because I can see differences in the way they're shot and the way effects were made and processed, and it's just not as familiar to me. But I'm also getting this extra level of appreciation these days for movies like this that I know of and that I've never seen. What I'm really saying is I'm hard pressed to watch movies that come from the 70s and earlier unless I think it's really going to be worth my time. I took that chance last night with a film I've never seen before, released one year earlier than Death Wish. A classic film to many of you, I'm sure, but to me, completely new, fresh, and exciting. We're talking about The Wicker Man. It's hard to describe the journey I undertook with this film. I had my doubts almost immediately when the first song kicked in, eventually faded out, and then would insert itself bizarrely in between the opening shots periodically. Corn rigs and barley rigs and corn rigs are bonny. These lyrics about a bonnie or an annie and, and some rice and some barley or... I don't know. I'll not forget that happy night. Come with me. Lesbian seagull, the mother leaves with Annie. Settle down and rest with me. I know it's likely a local traditional thing, and I certainly mean no offense, but I just can't help but picture a South Park episode and Randy running around all sarcastically singing this. Corn rigs and barley rigs and corn rigs are funny. Plot-wise, we've Sergeant Howie, a policeman from the mainland who's arrived on some small Scottish islands to investigate the disappearance of a young girl, and much to his chagrin at being unable to find any real answers from the unhelpful townsfolk, the always odd behavior of the islanders, the songs they sing, the pagan rituals they take part in. They all begin to slowly unnerve him. Now, some townsfolk claim to have never seen this missing girl. <laughs> I tell you no. Others claim that she's a hare. Hairs? She's a hare. Ron's a hare. She has a lovely time. Others say she's dead, but not really dead. She's dead? You would say so. Oh, come on, come on. She's either dead or she's not dead. Everyone's fucking insane and loopy, but not in that over-the-top kind of way either. There's an odd cult-like believability to the behavior and mannerisms these people exhibit. Now, suspecting the girl is still alive and being held prisoner for an eventual human sacrifice, deeper and deeper into the island's oddities he goes, even at one point with permission from the leader digging up a coffin to exhume a body believed to be that of Rowan, the missing girl. <laughs> Frustrated beyond measure with the circles the townsfolk seem to be running him in, the likely sabotage of the airplane he arrives in further complicates things, rendering him essentially stuck on the island with no way to communicate with the mainland. Also, there's an amazing scene in this movie that more than makes up for the cruddy little song at the beginning I'm not a big fan of. Corn rigs and barley rigs and... Let me clarify that. I don't think this song sucks or anything like that. It's just such an odd vibe to me. I don't know. And while staying in a room at one of the inns, the landlord's daughter puts on a mesmerizing performance. And it's not just because her titties and her ass are hanging out, which does help though. I'm not young and fair. This scene genuinely creeped me out. It hypnotized me. It fascinated me. And maybe it is because of the song and ritualistic connotations, paganism and all that, but man, it just felt like, gave me vibes like the end of The Witch. 
I don't even care for the actual point of the scene either, the seduction of Howie. I understand it was 1973, but I thought, and this is according to Austin Powers, to take that with a grain of salt, that there was a sexual revolution going on over there. Yeah, baby! Yeah. Long by this point. Oh. Howie is clearly old, and he's all saving himself for marriage. Lol. I mean, it was 1973. I understand things were different. Also, I'm not sure what kind of impact a scene like this had on audiences then. I can only speak for how it makes me feel now. Not at all interested in his side of things, that's for sure. But the dance this woman performs, the song, the rawness of it. It makes me think of Fever Ray 2, a very specific music video of hers. <laughs> I just love this scene to death for its completely bizarre, artistic, nonsensical statement in all its glory. I wonder if Midsommar fans like this movie because man, there's just a lot of similarities. Questions I asked myself after I finished watching Midsommar. Who am I? Did I just have a religious experience? Am I on drugs? Did I just reach Nirvana? And I saw Midsommar first, so that's why I'm asking. Now while there are honestly no huge twists and turns up to this point, the movie never seems that slow or boring as it carries along at a comfortable pace. And after dragging him and us through the mystery for just enough time to not feel annoyed, we eventually find him joining in the ritual, in disguise of course, and his suspicions proven true. It's Rowan. Now risking his own life to save the girl, here the movie does decide to reveal a small, or perhaps major at the time, twist. You came here to find Rowan Morrison, but it is we who have found you and brought you here, and controlled your every thought and action since you arrived. All of this was set up specifically to bait him to the island. We're the one we need. A man who would come here of his own free will. Things about his character, his nature, his lifestyle apparently made him the perfect sacrifice and the girl was simply bait. Even better, the ending completely sold me, even if by this point I was already in love with the film. Oh God! Oh Jesus Christ! The enormity of that wicker man. The knowledge of why it's made of wicker. Oh my God! Christ! The animals in the cages entombed in its legs. It was an utterly sinking feeling in my chest. And even though this film isn't exactly a horror film, this moment is what convinces me that it qualifies as one if you want to view it that way. I do. Paganism aside, these people baited an innocent man to their village and then they burned him alive. That's pretty fucking horrific. Now, I wonder how bad the Nicolas Cage adaptation of this is. Oh, no, not the beast! Not the beast! Even if it's bad, I bet Nick Cage is awesome in it. Ah! I love my eyes! My eyes! Ah! I still love Nick Cage. Ah!